My weekend routines weren't always like this. It wasn't even that long ago when I started watching F1. I've made some new friends during the first wave of COVID lockdowns through online gaming, and one of them obsesses about Formula One. She kept talking about the tidbits of the previous season and gushed about her favorite drivers, but all we can really say is, we have no idea what you're talking about. She insisted for all of us to start watching F1 so that she can have more people to talk to about the sport whenever she wanted. I didn't intend on following through on any of her suggestions, but I was really bored one afternoon and tuned in to Drive to Survive, which was her recommended starting point to the F1 world. Well, shit, here I am two years later and I've slotted F1 and motorsports in general as my second favorite sport just before basketball. While I do share the sentiment of most F1 fans that Drive to Survive is mostly garbage, it did set the table for the real show that F1 can really be. It was probably bound that I would love the sport as much as I do, which can stem from two things. My deep-rooted appreciation for sport narratives and my love for racing. I've been a seasoned basketball fan for over a decade, and I've been playing racing games since childhood, so this was a perfect match to be. While I await for the next wave of Mario Kart 8 DLC and the 2023 F1 season, why not do something fun and simple? I want to share my most and least favorite races to be featured on an F1 calendar as a new F1 fan. Every race since the start of the 2021 season will be included in this pool of tracks since 2021 was my first season watching the sport. How I'll be assessing each race will be mostly from my enjoyment driving the tracks themselves on racing simulators, but I will also consider the racing and entertainment value each track provides, though I do admit that this is rather subjective and a toss-up since each race can range from edge of your seat entertainment to an afternoon nap. Let's begin. Perhaps this pick won't mean much by next season as it will be removed off the calendar, but that still doesn't deny the lack of enjoyment the circuit brings. Two laughably long straights and a bunch of riffing on either side of the track. The most memorable section of the track stands from the flat out turn 10 to the sweeping turn 11 hairpin. Even then, turn 10 isn't the most exciting flat corner to be featured on the calendar. The real buzzkill of the track is the end of sector 1 bending into sector 2, which carries into the long back straight. It kills any flow after the charge down from turn 2 and then a sudden swing back to flat out speed. On an entertainment value, I didn't understand the hate towards Paul Ricard heading into the 2021 race, given that I had never seen a race take place in France before. To its credit, Max and Lewis provided an enjoyable race until the end with Red Bull pulling the late two-stop strategy Mercedes pulled on them a few races back in Barcelona. The 2022 race was met with the same... eh... Mostly given Charles Leclerc's spin out in the lead out of the race. Albert Park was missed on the 2021 calendar but made a triumphant return in 2022. That didn't stop me from doing countless laps in the Citadel Corsa and the F1 games in the meantime. The track is winding and free-flowing without any hindrance by a multitude of solo corners. I didn't mind the previous layout with the Turn 9 chicane and the tighter Turn 6, but the new layout heightens that swift feeling driving around the circuit. That crucial exit out of turn 6 with a daring overtaking opportunity at the now turn 9 10 chicane and the blast on the turn 11 is maximum adrenaline. The 2022 race wasn't the most exciting race of the year, especially at the front, but it had its moments within the pack, especially Alex Albon's heroic P10 drive. Portimao isn't on the calendar anymore as of writing this, but given the rules I set up for myself for this video, I had to throw it on the list. Here's a summary of me trying to drive this track. Fuck. Shit. Fuck. Fuck. Damn it. I don't think its layout is entirely horrible. It's just the actual roller coaster of a track that throws me off blind corners, mistakes around all of them, and for some reason, I am incapable of nailing turn 14 with any sort of consistency. I don't like it. Not a fan. No thanks. Well, I will say the drop out of turn 15 into the start finish straight, 
and the tight medium speed turn one is quite the thrill. Aside from that, yeah, no thanks. After becoming spoiled by the 2021 Imola Grand Prix, which was the first race I ever watched live, I was expecting all of them to be as exciting as Imola. And I learned an important lesson about watching Formula One. They all can't be bangers. I can't remember a single thing about this race before rewatching the highlights on YouTube. <sighs> oh, speaking of Imola. Maybe it's the bias that Imola was the first race I ever watched live, but the handful of Italian races to be featured on an F1 calendar, Imola is my favorite. Its narrow track demands precision, with minimal yet bold overtaking opportunities by the likes of turn 5, 12, and 17. The charge down to turn 2, the first braking zone of the circuit, is a zigzag mind game with the car in front, and the corner is deep enough to challenge with a late or early braking maneuver. The fight can continue all the way down to the very onto Villeneuve chicane and all the way to Tosa. Like Albert Park, it's tight, but weaving and free-flowing. Sensing a theme with the four tracks listed so far? While the 2021 race was more entertaining than this year's race despite the new regulations, as most cars were stuck in a DRS train, that doesn't deny the fact that this is an enjoyable track to drive on. The Mexico City track is one of the first of three circuits where I can sum up its layout with one word. Why? After the blast on the mega long start finish straight, you're met with a tight right hander and a chicane into another long straight, then a really tight chicane and then a hairpin. Then to close out sector two is a collection of Y corners with a mixture of medium speed S corners that aren't long enough to be satisfying and it closes out with a slow right left corner into the shortest straight ever. And while the stadium sector 3 is a visual marvel, that's really all it is. A tight hairpin into two slow corners to finish out the track. This circuit is anti-flow. Okay everyone, please rise for the Canadian National Anthem because it's my home circuit. It bummed me out hearing that the Canadian Grand Prix for 2021 was cancelled due to the pandemic. In 2022, I finally had the chance to watch F1 cars zoom around a circuit on Canadian soil. Sounds ridiculous, I know, but there's some national pride to be had on an international stage. This might sound all biased as a Canadian and contradictory given to what I said about other tracks, but this course has such an amazing flow all throughout the circuit with perhaps the exception of the odd turn 1-2 hairpin. The latter half of Sector 1 into Sector 2 has got to be my favorite collection of corners on the calendar. A medium speed chicane into a flat out turn 5 into a heavy braking zone turn 6-7 S turn. This is my favorite overtaking spot on the calendar. Then after that, the blast down into the turn 8 9 chicane just keeps battles going, but the flow never stops. I think ultimately why I love this track so much is there are overtaking opportunities all throughout, some more daring than others. But why this track doesn't make the top of my list ultimately is the turn 10 hairpin. But it's a double-edged sword because like I said, there are overtaking opportunities elsewhere and turn 10 is one of the more common spots. But man, this track is goddamn awesome. There are similar characteristics between Cota and the Mexico City track. Both share a collection of confusing S-turns that don't really amount to anything or any satisfaction. A ridiculously long straight into another collection of slow corners that just have me asking why. It feels like it's winding without purpose. The flowing nature of the track is completely destroyed after the long back straight with three slow corners in succession. Then you have a flat out turn 16 to 18 section immediately followed by more slow corners. It's not a difficult track to drive on, it's just I'm not having any fun driving on it. But contradictory to what I just said, the 2022 race was pretty damn entertaining. But I hate this track. Going from anti-flow to another track full of flow is the Hungaro Ring. I absolutely hated this track when I started playing F1 games initially. Perhaps it was my fault for picking Haas as the team I drove for in my career and 
Trying to pull that dumpster around what is essentially Monica without walls wasn't the most thrilling experience on Earth. I hated the turn 6-7 chicane. I hated the entirety of Sector 2. Somewhat medium speed corners followed by a short straight down into Sector 3 hairpin. As Martin Brendel said on the broadcast, the corners come at you quick. He's right. There's no time to breathe on this track aside from the start finish straight and then the two short straights of turn 4 and turn 12. But something changed however. Maybe it was after the eye-popping Edge of Your Seat 2021 race that saw Alpine's Espanolcon win his first ever race. I just wanted to learn the track after that. The Hungaro Ring was, for some reason, the first track I decided to remove the last of my driving assists, a dynamic racing line. What better track to learn braking zones and speeds than the Hungaro Ring, where that precision truly matters above most other tracks? The Hungara Ring is punishing, but also satisfying. It edges on that border just enough that elicits joy, nailing each corner perfectly. While this is a difficult track to overtake on, with few opportunities unless you are bolder than bold font, I feel alive battling and swerving around this circuit. Unlike its other counterpart. You can boo me all you want for this take. I don't care. Leading up to my first Monaco race in 2021, I was truly excited to see what all the hype was all about. It's cited as the most difficult track to race on, and every promo piece thrown at me at the time establishes aura of warranted elitism. I almost fell asleep watching this race. It didn't help that here on the East Coast in North America, most of the races take place in the early hours of the Sunday, so I was already fighting myself to stay awake. I understand the history, the technical skill needed to drive a perfect monocle lap, but I don't value that when evaluating a spectacle. After watching two Monaco races as of writing this, the dramatic moments are few and far between unless someone makes a critical error. Things like Valtteri Bottas' miserable wheel nut pit stop in 2021, Mick Schumacher's offline crash, and Ferrari's questionable double stack pit strategy from this year. On a personal level, I do not find any joy driving this track at all. Maybe because I still suck at simulation driving, but there is no pleasure pumping in laps around Monaco. Aside from maybe nailing swimming pool section, everything else I can live without. I'm just gonna say it, the Singapore street circuit is the better Monaco. A tight, challenging street circuit that does have some room to breathe. Just like the Hungara Ring, it sits on that edge of absolutely challenging to satisfying with immense flow throughout the track. It sits above all else, especially Hungara Ring, because it is a street circuit. Ultimate punishment, but ultimate reward. I find that the Marina Bay circuit is the true balance between the two. It's not excruciating punishment with little reward such as Monaco, and it does have a good flow. I can't point out a singular favorite track or sector because I think it's all great. It's great. I can't fluff up more about the circuit because I would just be riffing. The best part though? The proposed 2023 layout is going to be even better with a longer back straight. Overtaking at Singapore? Great. Having skipped both the 2020 and 21 seasons, I couldn't wait to see what the 2022 cars could do on this track and... Well, it was the best worst race ever. It was so goddamn weird that I was just compelled to be glued to the screen, even if nothing was really happening in the grand scope of the race. But, again, I still love this track among all others. I think stepping out of this top and bottom five list, there can be some conclusions as to how I got to this point as a new F1 fan. I came to love racing through Mario Kart. The thing with Mario Kart is, you can drive each track like this without drifting, but to maximize lap time, it has to be carried out like this. Of course, there are pro Mario Kart racers that master advanced techniques to squeeze out even more insane lap times like this, but this is the basis of what is possible in Mario Kart. Looking at my favorite tracks and knowing my approaches to Mario Kart, there is a baseline to how I got to putting this list together. There is a constant flow inertia throughout each track. Tracks like Mexico City and Kota, with its 
mishmash of fast, slow, fast, slow sectors goes against my enjoyment of racing. And tracks like the Gilles Villeneuve, Ngaro Ring, and Marina Bay satisfy this itch with constantly moving. Each F1 fan is different, and I belong to a new generation of fans removed from the lore and history that the sport carries around with pride. But we're all here for the same reasons. We all love racing. I won't deny someone who loves tracks like Monaco and Spa because I'm extremely late to the party, but I can appreciate them for what they stand for in the testament of F1 history.